All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jay Ligorio. Uh, I'm down here from DC, and I wanted to talk about, uh, well, really everything we've been talking about today. We've been talking about open source development and how awesome that is. We've been talking about securing AWS and how hard it is, but how necessary it is. Uh, and so now I want to talk about what happens when that all goes wrong. Uh, so what happens when developers put stuff on the internet that they shouldn't be putting on the internet and how you can find it. Uh, but first, before I get started with this, I want to thank Music City Con. It's, uh, putting on a conference is really, really difficult. Putting on a first year conference is even more difficult. Uh, and I think they've done a great job so far. So well done, guys. And thanks for having me out. So I'll talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I'll talk about what do I want to find and how do I get it when I target developers. Uh, where can I get that stuff? What can, what can I do to get merciless automation? Any results that I've found? What I can do uh, if, so that I am not affected by this? Uh, and, so, and how to correct it if I already am? What's next for, for this kind of project? And I'll answer any questions. Uh, so first, my name's Jay. Uh, I got a, a bachelor's from UMBC. It's a school in Maryland and got a master's from the Naval Postgraduate School uh, in California. Uh, we talked about certifications today, CISSP, various SANS certs over the years. Uh, I've never taken a SANS class that is anything less than excellent, uh, so if, just throw that out for the certificate discussion. Uh, I'm a developer. Uh, I've been an IT consultant. I'm a licensed PI out of DC. Uh, my projects, uh, both in school and out of school, have been a lot of programming things. Uh, I'll go over some of those. I took a, a Maryland-based ambulance company from a domain controller in a closet in a kitchen to a facility that has like a data center room and actual racks, and I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, and I've worked in plenty of other sectors and for myself. Uh, I've been a Win32 developer for a very long time. If you remember the Pocket PC and those fold-out keyboards, uh, for whatever reason, Microsoft decided not to wire up the keyboard shortcuts in things like Pocket Word. Found that annoying. Uh, so kind of one of my first hacking in public was adding that feature to that platform. Uh, and that was back when you really had to want to download an app. I got about a million downloads. I was pretty happy about that. I've uh, been a .NET developer, developer for a while, too. Uh, when the Facebook API came out, there wasn't really a glue layer to let you write .NET code against the Facebook REST API, uh, and I'm really sorry that I did that. Uh, we've also done, uh, I've also done workflow management with, uh, with UMBC, uh, created a tool that integrated with their PHP workflow to sort of route forms and do workflow management. That was, uh, that was pretty useful, and I wrote the tool that we'll discuss today. Uh, I've also done some software reverse engineering uh, for some medical stuff, kind of opening up access to devices. Uh, and, and I want to, I'll sort of give another side tip. When you license an expensive third party library and include it in your driver, don't have the plain text serial number in your driver. Just don't do that because now I have it and that's a free $10,000 license. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm generally, just a generally curious but law abiding troublemaker. I'm not trying to go to jail. Uh, so, what do I want and how do I get it? I'm putting my OSINTER hat on today, uh, and I want to find cool stuff on the internet that probably shouldn't be on the internet, and then I'm going to engage in responsible disclosure. So what's cool stuff? Private keys and cryptographic material, API keys and secrets, configuration files that might contain creds, open buckets with sensitive data, we've talked a little about AWS today, uh, and I want to find my private data that's unexpectedly on the internet. Uh, but trolling for random data is really labor-intensive, labor but you do get the best payoff. Uh, there's an umpteen million credentials that are found in countless pastes and paste bin. Verizon Wireless, FedEx, Capital One, GoDaddy have all had data, customer data, dumped on the internet, usually in buckets found by places like Chrome Tech Security and UpGuard. Uh, Pocket iNet is a wireless ISP out in the Pacific Northwest. UpGuard found a bucket there last year. And Chris Vickery found a bucket last year for the North Carolina Board of Elections, which kind of sucks. Uh, so the pace are many and varied. Uh, there are always going to be more of them, but buckets are really big and you get a lot of bang for your buck. Uh, let's go through uh, two examples of that. One of them uh, is Pocket iNet, again, a wireless ISP out in the Pacific. Now, they have a picture of a, a random data cabinet in, in one of their, their locations, and this is probably fine. This is not that risky. It does show lack of duty of care, 
Uh, and it's not going to win you any awards on the cable porn subreddit, but it's probably not that bad, right? But what if it's this, except not redacted, right? So if I'm an attacker, this gives me a blueprint. I don't have to do nearly anything in terms of enumeration, in terms of things that would set off alarms and make a lot of noise on your audits. You just gave me the map. So this doesn't, you know, this, this isn't the worst thing in the world, though, because it's not like you have credentials in the bucket, except when you do. And maybe, maybe I'm being charitable, and under those, under those uh, redactions there, it says things like sales credentials or HR credentials, not keys to the kingdom credentials that could get your entire infrastructure popped. But I'm not charitable, because that's what's in it. Uh, my favorite part of this particular password sheet is when they realized that having the same password on all their servers was bad, so uh, that's line 11. And then line 12 is where they decided they needed a new password for all their servers, just doing the same thing again. That's my favorite part of that. Uh, what else can we talk about? How about the North Carolina Board of Elections uh, had an open bucket out? And as you saw, it's not necessarily just, just customer data or voter data that can be out here. This is pretty serious because it includes a lot of voter system master passwords that sure they said would probably have been rolled, but in practice that doesn't usually happen. Uh, just in case you can't read that top one, that gives uh, world readable uh, permissions to everyone who tries to open the bucket. And the passwords aren't really user passwords. There's things like service menu, uh, lock and unlock, upload firmware, which is code execution, right? So that's pretty bad. Buckets are everywhere, we're always going to have buckets. Now that's general data searching, but even targeted red teaming, uh, it's labor intensive because I've got to do subdomain searching and repo scraping. I've got API endpoint discovery so I can see what I need to go abuse. Maybe I reverse engineer an app to do that. Uh, confidential and, configu and configuration data, you can do all of this manually with a lot of Google searches and targeted keyword lists, but again, I don't have time to do that. Computers should be doing things that I don't want to do because I'm lazy, and I don't want to manually find cool stuff I want it brought to me because I'm lazy. What I need is merciless automation because I'm lazy. Uh, and I'd like a front end to go through everything uh, that was found with the automation. Even if it kind of sucks, uh, it, it would be better than nothing. So where would I go to find these things? I'm going to start with Pastebin because it's easy. They give you the, the ability to do this. So developers post paste, they put their source code in it, and, uh, and they don't, there's literally one checkbox you can check to make these, po these pastes protected, but nobody checks them. And they'll put things in like API keys or session keys or things you don't want, uh, passwords even, things you don't want in pastes. I guess the only thing I can really come up with is this works for someone's workflow who doesn't have a good collab tool, but that, I mean, that's the only thing that I can find. We can never know why people do this, but it's very inadvisable. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, and they, they put in, the, their, in their source code the API keys, salts, hard-coded creds, really juicy stuff like that. And Pastebin tells you how to scrape their, their service. Uh, they say, don't scrape our website, but we've set up a special endpoint. And you can go ahead and hit this endpoint as much as you want, as many times as you want, and download all of the paste in the world. Uh, and it's cheap. It's real cheap. It often goes on sale for $30 for a lifetime subscription. Just once. So this is an example of what you would do to scrape Pastebin. You sign up for your lifetime, uh, your, your lifetime account, and then you hit that one API endpoint. You don't even give it, uh, you don't give it credentials, you don't give it anything. You just log in from the IP address that you tell them in advance. And it tells you all of the newly recent uh, posted pastes. And the idea is to go to the scrape URL, download the whole thing, parse it to see if it has anything interesting. It often does. So where else would I go? Go where the developers live. That's GitHub. They give you a programmatic uh, interface to go and scrape their search. Now, I'm a developer and I do stupid stuff all the time, but I'm not special. Surely there are other developers that put stupid stuff on the internet all the time. So you plug keywords that correspond to those things that shouldn't be there on GitHub, and it uses their search API. Again, that's keys, salts, hard-coded creds, et cetera. It's all out there. And it doubles as a platform for responsible disclosure, so we can let developers know by filing issues that there's a problem they should correct. And boy, are there problems. 
Finally, one last description of S3 buckets. Giant treasure trove of data, all kinds of useful stuff just strewn all over the internet. There's about 20 regions. Uh, the biggest one is probably US East 1 because it's the default. Uh, but the data could be anywhere or any, in any of those regions or in just one or all of them. Uh, you can store any type of file with near limitless size. The, the amount of data in there is very, very good. Uh, and you access them either through a domain name or through a directory, a, uh, an AWS uh, domain name with a directory. And I'll, I'll give an example of that later. But there's no master index. So we have to find strategies for finding buckets. One of them is the protoxin list. And this is by a security researcher in Virginia. He collects buckets uh, just to research AW, uh, I'm sorry, S3. And he adds to the list periodically. So not all the buckets are accessed publicly now, but you never know when someone is going to get frustrated with an overly restrictive permission and just open it to the world and then, oh yeah, 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 I'll totally close it later. And then he never closes it. So you can pull the list in real time via REST uh, and check for new additions between now and the last time you pulled it, uh, or you can and queue that bucket for a check, or you can check the buckets that you already have, uh, just to see if someone has again opened it up in frustration. Uh, and there's 20,000 free bucket names out there, so that's a very good start. Now, the other, the other vehicle we can scrape is something called CertStream. Whenever a certificate authority generates a certificate that's going to be trusted by Firefox or Chrome, they're required to make an entry in what are called the, trans the certificate transparency logs. So CertStream is a real-time hook into that, and, uh, and you can watch for either domains that you own to make sure nobody else is generating certificates for your properties, or certificates for properties of interest, even if you don't own them. Uh, and now since we know that bucket domain names follow a well-formed pattern that start with s3.amazon.aws.com, we can find all the new domains, uh, sorry, all the new certificates generated for new domains when they're created, uh, or existing buckets when the old certificates expire and they're renewing certificates. And again, it's a simple JSON stream. It's, uh, you, can, you can pull it down with anything. It's really easy. This is a, a graphic from their website. Really, it's just a fire hose uh, of all the certificates that are being created as they're being created. It's pretty cool. And the other location you can get buckets uh, are DNS server logs if you run your own open relay, or, uh, or your own relay, I should say. Uh, a lot of websites and a lot of JavaScript on the website, the client side stuff, will pull uh, assets and resources from buckets directly while the script is running. So if you do own your own DNS relay, just turn logging on and process the data periodically. And again, it's easy to pick out s3.amazon.aws.com. And finally, there's this trick that I, that I found uh, recently from this guy whose Twitter handle is OXMDV. You find a bucket address, and it's been, uh, it's been obfus obfuscated or, or mounted through a website. So if you look at this, this URL, path2 is actually underlying. Uh, it's routed to a bucket. And so you add percent zero to the end of the URL, and it breaks Amazon's parser. And then the XML error exposes the name of the bucket. So if you see up in the address bar here, the directory's name is, is avatars, but that's not the name of the bucket. The name of the bucket, which is partially obscured, does have avatars in it, but avatars is not it. So they, uh, they accidentally disclose a bunch of information. So thanks to that guy for that trick. That's been pretty useful. So I talked about all this stuff. Where's the merciless automation? And this is the stuff where I want to go to bed, and when I wake up in the morning, I want to have a whole bunch of cool results. So crawl is a Windows service that crawls Pastebin and GitHub for everything that we've talked about. It, uh, it's a keyword-based search engine. And it divides workflows, workflows up into different data processors that run on different threads so that nothing's holding anything else up. It's backed by SQL Server for data storage and coordination among the processors. Uh, it saves posts from Pastebin and commits from GitHub when they contain those keywords of interest that you, could, that you define. And you can add keywords later on after you've already started the process. So let's say I come across a tweet by this guy and I notice Google API key, Facebook app ID, those are really good keywords that I don't already have in my search engine. Just drop them in and the next time that search cycle runs, it'll do a search for these things even though it already uh, has had several other different types of keywords. So you can also queue Amazon S3 buckets for query if they come from the protoxin list, if they come from cert stream in real time, if you process a DNS server log, uh, it'll queue all those buckets and it'll try to, to 
enumerate the resources in those buckets as much as possible. So uh, yeah, queues the buckets for search and searches them for file names and extensions of interest. Again, buckets can be huge, and unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of downloading an entire bucket just to see what's in it. So for bucket search, it does fall back on extensions uh, and keywords and file names. And it saves interesting data to the database and attracts its origin so that you can then go back to wherever it came from and, uh, and give the developer a shout. So it has a front end that runs on IIS for content uh, indexing, search, and presentation. You page through the results and you kind of explore things that look interesting. The rest roll off after I think two weeks so that you don't completely exhaust your storage. Uh, it's just a SQL Server agent job that runs. And, uh, and it is more than a little rough. Uh, I've never been big into, into web UI. But it's, I mean, it's functional. Tells you what kind of site that the data came off of. It gives you the address, the deep link into that site, which keyword uh, caused it to, to want to capture that data, and the date that it was collected. If you notice the sizes, those are all, uh, a lot of them are zero. That's just because the download thread has not come up behind the search processor. So what, what GitHub does is they, uh, they will throttle you. And in a header, it gives you a well-defined period of time before you're allowed to keep going. And so it'll, it'll observe that, uh, that period of time and just keep downloading as much as possible until it gets told to wait again. But again, that, ha that's, uh, that is all automated. So you can run it from a single system, and it's, it's pretty easy to do that. Uh, the, but the, technically, the SQL, the web, and the search services, and even the individual search services can all be sep on separate systems as long as you point them all at each other. So if you want to scale out, you can have maybe one system that does pay spin. Uh, you notice that GitHub is high bandwidth. You put three systems on that. Uh, or maybe you have two systems that do bucket dumping, and they all just kind of coordinate uh, between each other and dump everything into the SQL server, which is the one component that you do need to scale up if you, uh, if you find that you're running out of storage or running out of bandwidth between all of the systems. So let's talk about results. I can find an API key for damn near any service out there. Easy. Uh, Last.fm and Discord API keys are in the example here. So I started the scanner and it immediately came back with these. And I clicked the link and there it was, I saw the content. And that was great. So I went to the, uh, the repo where that was all stored because I wanted to give the developer a path to the file name. But I noticed that the files were gone. But if the files were gone, how could I have opened them through GitHub? Now the reason the files were gone is because the developer realized his mistake and deleted the files. But the data, the underlying data, because of the way Git works, is still there. So when you commit private information to GitHub, you have a serious task on, on yourself to actually get that down. And we'll discuss a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, this is a file called config.json. What I, and it did have a token in it. What I found most impressive about this is that it only took 17 minutes from the time it posted to the time I found it. And uh, that's a really low time to compromise. But yeah, I, I'm sure that I could find an API key for damn near any service. I only spent 30 minutes doing this and most of that time was spent uh, uh, redacting the actual API keys. But if you want a uh, Flickr API key, IP address, geolocation, uh, all kinds of Google Map stuff, yeah, you can find it. It's easy. Now this is some code from a paste that I found where not only did the client ID and client secret show up in the Python code, the user, it's a Reddit bot, by the way, the username and password were also included. Uh, again, not that great. Uh, sent the guy a message to, uh, to roll that password. Uh, don't know if they ever did, never checked back. So this issue, I know we, uh, we're all real developers and so we test in production, uh, but these guys had test systems that were out on the internet open to anybody with passwords. And I know that, uh, that test systems with passwords generally tend to graduate to production systems with the same passwords. So I dropped them a note and, uh, and after about a week I didn't hear back and so I went to go check on the issue that I, that I filed and I decided that uh, any issue that was marked, uh, made in July 2015 and marked soon was not gonna get answered uh, in five days. So I kinda let that one go. Also, I don't speak whatever Cyrillic language that is. Now, I mentioned that I, I did some Facebook API work uh, a long time ago, and for that I'm very sorry. Uh, but what that has given me kinda insight into how the access tokens work, and what it boils down to 
is you can figure out who owns an access token just by having the access token. So this guy had a bot. Uh, he generated an access token, stuck it in a paste. Paste wasn't protected. So uh, I dropped him a line because I'm nearly 100% positive it's this guy. Now what I think happened here is that when, when somebody, when you try to message somebody on Facebook and you don't have any connections to them, you don't have any mutual friends, never went to the same school, uh, clearly we've never been in the same place at the same time and Facebook would know that because it's terrible. Uh, they know that you might be spam and so they put you in something called the other inbox which no one checks. Uh, some of you may not even know that you had that inbox and so now I'm telling you. But anyway, I think that's where my message went uh, and so I didn't really expect to hear back from him. Now this one was nice because it is one technique informing another technique. This is a paste bin, uh, a paste bin paste that includes a bucket, and we can tell because it starts with s3.amazon.aws.com, and in this uh, this notation of the bucket, it's called Yo Yo Zeus. Uh, so that's the the directory representation of that bucket. So that was kind of neat when I found uh, a bucket to add to my list with a technique that wasn't even intended to do that. And the, the false positives that I get a lot uh, with this particular technique are M3U playlists. And that's because the underlying content that is generally in the playlist is in a bucket. And so you just kind of sift through those. They don't, really, they don't really do anything. The music is weird. So yeah, we just kind of go away from those. Uh, and I found so much cryptographic material. It just so, so much. Uh, begin RSA private key was, uh, was one of my top keywords for a while. Uh, and the other thing that I found that I thought was interesting was uh, AWS tokens that got you uh, content from a Taiwanese social media service in the making. Now, Taiwan has a, uh, they, they have recognized the trash fire that is the American social media system, and they have said, well, if you want a social media account in Taiwan, you have to validate with your password, uh, passport, sorry, and, uh, and a selfie. And so they have implemented that. And this social media service said, okay, well that's great, we're gonna have a bucket with all the public social media data that everybody is supposed to see anyway. And in the same bucket, we will store the passports and the selfies. Uh, they, they even had a separate service to do the verification, however they stored the data in the same place. So separation of privilege, those should be different buckets. Those AWS uh, creds that work for the passports and selfies should not work for the social media site and vice versa. Uh, these are better things that we can all do. So, how do I not be these people? If you're doing development in open source, out in the open where anybody can see it, you really need to be hyper vigilant about what you commit to your project because once you put it up there, there's no taking it back. So don't pull API keys from inside your, product, your project. Pull them from environmental variables that are going to be system specific uh, it, or from files that are outside of the actual part of your project that you commit to GitHub. And bonus, now you can develop in test and production with different keys and codes. So everybody wins. That's great from an engineering perspective. Uh, and don't use pastebin as group chat unless you filter out all that sensitive information because you can, anybody can scrape it. It's very easy to do. So what if it's too late? You, as we already saw, you can't just delete the file and call it a day because Git remembers everything. It's how, the, it's how it, was, it was planned to be. And this is gonna suck if your project is big, or if it's complicated, or if you have a lot of developers. Now, e the easiest thing to do is to download the entire repo yourself, separate all of your content out, make a new repo, and recommit that. That also sucks, but at least it's not going through the hellish gymnastics that it would take to get something out of Git. And uh, this guy right here has actually a really good tutorial on how to get data out of Git that you have accidentally committed. I don't know who he is, he's just a guy, but his, uh, his, these are the simplest directions that I could find and they were still pretty not simple. So now on the bucket side, we're done with the doom and gloom on, of GitHub, but with the bucket side, how do you not open your bucket up to the world? Not a goddamn thing. When you create your bucket, you get this thing right at the top. Do not grant public read access to this bucket. The default permission when you create the bucket on the same screen, do not create public, or do not grant public read access to this bucket, and it's recommended. On the same page is yet another third warning. They are making this so easy not to open your bucket up to the entire world. Uh, now, it's almost that easy. 
I think Amazon did one, one disservice. If you look at this, are there any Windows admins or former Windows admins in the audience? Nobody has ever admined Windows? Okay, so you know with authenticated users that somebody in your domain has authenticated with a username and a password. Doesn't matter who they are, but they are of your enterprise. Now somebody, somebody not in your domain who can authenticate to a different domain, he has authenticated users over there, but not in your domain, unless you do some other stuff, but that's intentional. With this, authenticated users is anyone with an AWS token, which are as cheap as free. So it's not just anybody with an AWS token in your enterprise, it's literally anyone. So the way we take advantage of this is let's say I scan a bucket with uh, anonymous credentials and it says, nope, don't know you, you're not allowed to go in. But they have the authenticated read permission on their bucket. I have my own AWS credentials. I present those to that bucket and it says, oh, well you're an authenticated user. I'll just open the whole thing up. I think that was a disservice. Uh, but that's just me. Anyway, don't use this, it's not great, and it's how a lot of those other customer data, the, the Verizon wirelesses, the FedExes, the, uh, the, the things that UpGuard has found, that's generally what the, the root cause of the problem has been. And the easy fix is this, is just fix the permissions. Uh, there's, no, there's no terrible git incantation that you have to do, it really is just some checkboxes, uh, so that's, that's a, a good thing for AWS. And so you should audit all of your buckets. Make sure you're following the principles of least privilege. Uh, like that social media site, the really sensitive stuff should be in one bucket. The less sensitive stuff should be in another. The AWS tokens should be different. This, this is a more difficult thing, but I think we can all do it. I believe in everybody. So what's next for this tool? I would handle bucket domains better. Right now it's only looking for s3.amazonaws.com, but there are other uh, fully qualified domain names that will constitute the, the read into the bucket. And it generally is around uh, the regions of the, of the world that those, that those data centers are, are located. So right now it assumes US East. If a bucket is in more than one region, including US East, it'll work fine. If it's in other buckets that are not US East, it's not gonna read properly, uh, so I would add to that. Now the, the data structures and the schema in the database are architected so that you could handle Azure and DigitalOcean equivalents of S3. Uh, I just didn't implement those. Uh, I would do that if I had more time. And a front end that isn't trash garbage. Uh, yes, drunk toddlers do top the list of front end web devs that are better than me. And, uh, and something that I would add is uh, the ability to, to decode fi uh, known file types. So let's say I find uh, a digital certificate, you know, .cer, if I click that, it would open maybe say, uh, you know, in a well-formatted way what sites it goes to, uh, what, you know, some of the key material, things like that. Uh, there's also this other service called Grey Hat Warfare, and I would integrate with that. It's kind of like the Protoxin list, but it's bigger. They actually download all of the files of all of the buckets that they find, and they offer a subscription. So it's either free with some limits on what files you can download, or it's 20, uh, 20 euro a month. It was, too, uh, it was, it was over my, my what the hell research budget, so I didn't actually do it. Uh, but they do offer an easy to use API, and I think it would be very similar to querying uh, the Protoxin list and then just following up with the bucket itself. So you can either scrape their database of buckets and then go out to the bucket yourself if you wanted to, or you can just download the file that they've already downloaded, or you can do a cross between both. Uh, maybe the bucket has now been secured, but they still have a copy of the data, Grey Hat Warfare does, you still get your data. And so this is an example of how easy they make their API. Uh, it really is API slash v1 slash bucket slash search criteria. So that's pretty cool. I would add some integrations from other open source projects. Uh, th that includes Truffle Hog and Get All Secrets. And I would scan for entropy. So good, uh, good crypto material looks random. It, it scores in the, in the percentage wise, you know, close to 100% random. Uh, and so if I find a file that maybe doesn't have a, uh, a file extension or it doesn't look immediately useful, if the entropy is way, way high, I'm gonna say, ooh, that might be some, some crypto material, I'm gonna grab that. Uh, and Trufflehog and Git All Secrets, uh, they are good for looking at the history of a Git, a Git project so that you can find previously committed things that have then been deleted. Uh, and I, re I recognize that those are, uh, that those are Linux projects, uh, but I will say that the next version of Windows is gonna have a full up Windows, uh, sorry, Linux kernel in it. And so I think that in integration should be, should be possible down the line. And of course it's open source software, so pull requests are welcome. 
So I want to thank these guys because they, uh, it started with kind of protoxin and he got me into this idea of looking for buckets and then I got into the, onto the other tangents that produced this project. Uh, and uh, yeah, so thanks to them. So I talked a little bit about myself, we can ignore that. I talked about what I wanted to get, uh, where I could get it, and how I can automate all that. And I went through some results and tried to help you figure out how to protect yourself. Uh, and so with that, again, thanks Music City Con, and I'll take any questions. Awesome, I, even, I, either, uh, I either killed it or it was terrible. So <laughs> thanks guys.